Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan, sharing the wisdom and insight of those who have been there and done that. and welcome back to Uncommon Sense, a chance to be together and to hear from real people talk about real life as they have experienced it. Today with me is Larry Reed, someone I've known for many a year and enjoyed for many a year. Uh, there's several things I admire about Larry. One is his optimism, but beyond that, his enthusiasm, his willing to see things through, his never giving up on anything that's important to him. And so, Larry, as I explained to you earlier, this, this is a chance to, to share yes. with others. What do you tell yourself when hard times hit you? Well, Junior, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be with you. I tell myself that uh, it never pays to let yourself get down. It never pays to slow up. Uh, it never pays to be pessimistic. Pessimism is self-fulfilling. Hmm. Uh, I'm an optimist by nature. As a matter of fact, I've often thought that uh, I'm almost pathologically optimistic. I, uh, it's very natural for me to think of the good side of mm. something uh, immediately when, when facing it. And I think that helps me get through uh, some difficult times. So optimism is important, I think, in life. It's motivating, it's animating, it's inspiring, it helps to attract others to your cause if you feel that the future is better and brighter uh, than the present and we need to march toward it uh, with a very positive outlook. Uh, I think that is so much more motivating than, uh, than a pessimistic or an indifferent mm. attitude. Yeah, so I, I think optimism has to be uh, uh, one of the many keys to uh, a successful life and a happy life. Now, how did you come to that? Uh a viewpoint. I wish I could say I knew. It seems that it's been with me as long as uh, I can remember, but I do believe I have strengthened that optimism simply by the reading I've done in uh, the biographies of great men and women. Mm. Uh, I do a lot of that sort of reading, historical biographies of great uh, people who have inspired others, and you can hardly do that without coming away with a sense of optimism. When you, when you see that there have been many people in history who had faced uh, many obstacles, some mm. so daunting you wonder if they could ever have gotten through it, but they did and they went on to inspire and to accomplish great things. So I, I really recommend to people that uh, in their spare time they should be reading biographies of great men and women who accomplished wonderful things against great odds. People like David Livingston, the great uh, missionary and uh, explorer, Mm. who uh, blazed trails in Africa in the 19th century at, uh, facing enormous obstacles. Uh, he's one of many people that I enjoy reading about because of their lifetimes of accomplishment and uh, their sense of optimism. It sounds as though you would recommend, or at least for yourself, um, deciding on what you wanted to do and not let the ups and downs of life. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. I think uh, just like a business settles on a strategic plan, uh -huh. and moves forward to achieve objectives along the way and ultimately fulfill the plan, I think we as individuals should have a strategic plan for our lives. We should know what our highest and best talents are and, and how to put them to good use. Uh, we should look upon life as, uh, uh, well, from a, from a Christian perspective, I look upon life as character building for eternity. Mm. This is the time when you're here on earth when you should be uh, doing all that you can to be the very best you can be in all that you do and hopefully inspire others in the process. And in the end, there'll be great rewards for that. Oh, well, that's really an interesting approach. The character building for eternity and helping your uh, fellow person. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and drawing inspiration from others who have uh, behaved in the same fashion. Uh, I think when you look at the lives of great men and women who have accomplished so much, you often see that they have placed um, as a priority something above themselves, mm -hmm. that they have determined at some point along the way that life isn't all about just them. Mm -hmm. It's about something higher, something more important. Uh, could be reverence for our Creator, and uh, it could be uh, 
uh, improving the lot of all mankind through our efforts uh, here on earth to uh, uh, improve education or science or health, whatever, but some objective that is more than just you here and now, something that's future oriented and that is helpful to as many people as possible. That's inspiring. Uh, on the way to uh, having these life plans or goals, uh, when you encounter a door that is shut or difficulties that arise, mm -hmm. How, how do you handle that? What do you tell yourself? If you, you plan to go down one road and that yes. road is blocked, mm -hmm. what then do you say to yourself? Well, you have to have the, the wisdom, I think, to use good judgment to decide whether that is a door that's permanently blocked that it would be futile to try to, uh, mm -hmm. to knock down mm -hmm. and maybe find a way around it mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, a door that's simply difficult to open, but it would be a challenge and very rewarding if you, in fact, worked to open it. Uh, you know, there are some doors that you just can't open. There are mm -hmm. some people that you will not persuade to your way of thinking, for example. Uh, that doesn't mean that you give up. It means you move on to a, another challenge. Um, but you have to have, I think, some judgment, some wisdom to decide what kind of a door is this? Is this one I should work to continue to open? Or is it so closed that it would be more worthwhile to go around it and find other, other objectives? Have you had experiences where things happen and it changes um, your desire for the goal or the goal changes because of something happening? Um, I often wonder, you know, there's that expression, life, uh, what is it, um, life happens on the way to your goals. What, what was the expression like that? Turn, uh, Jeanette Alfrey once said it to me and I laughed really hard when she first uh, life is what happens on the way to your goals. In oh, other words, okay. yeah. and she, I was laughing, at, and I said, oh, Jeanette, that's really so clever. And she said, well, it's not, you yes. know, it's just yeah. one of those sayings, you, you know, that yes. are out there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, have there been turning points when, when you have just said, okay, no, I'm changing the goals, and how did that come to be? Well, I, I put my goals, I think, in two different categories. Mm -hmm. uh, one are the, uh, the very broad, lifelong uh, goals, and I can't say I've ever changed those. Uh, from my uh, years as a teenager, I determined that one of my overriding goals in life would be to advance the cause of individual liberty in a free economy, and I've never wavered from that. I have found different ways to do that uh, in the classroom for a time and then at a think tank, the Mackinac Center. Different ways to do it, but the objective is still very much there. But along the way, of course, you have uh, objectives um, that are a little less important, and uh, those you can change and adjust and if you're flexible. And so along the way I have found, well, to achieve this objective, maybe it would be better to try this approach instead of the one I was intent upon for so long. You have to be flexible and uh, learn from life, not simply be uh, intransigent on all matters. But the big overriding goals, uh, I've never changed and don't anticipate that they'll change. Uh, when you turn 50 and realize that you've spent 35 years trying to advance those larger objectives, Right. Uh, and been very happy at doing it, right. it's not likely that you're going to move on to a totally different objective. I know you like to have fun. Yes. <laughs> and I wondered what, what you're doing for fun these days. Okay. Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, my work is fun. Right. I enjoy the work at the Mackinac Center very much. I enjoy writing. I enjoy speaking. I enjoy doing whatever I can to advance uh, sound public policy. So, uh, so I really, I wouldn't uh, put work in a separate category. It's fun to me, and I think really a person ought to find work that he also finds is mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. So you can enjoy what you do for a living. Uh, but aside from that, in, when I'm not working, um, I have a range of interests. I have skydived. Uh, I have, uh, or is it skydove? I'm not sure, but in any event, I've done it more Up than there. once. <laughs> <laughs> and I have uh, enjoyed fishing fly fishing as well as spin casting for a long time. I enjoy tennis. I enjoy world travel. I've been to some 60 countries, and many of them on several occasions, many times. Um, I enjoy, uh, when I have a chance, a little bit of uh, home cooking. Uh, I enjoy uh, a reading. I do a great deal of reading in history, uh, Roman history, uh, British history, uh, U.S. history, 19th century in particular, uh, Christian history. Uh, and a little bit of economics, but uh, probably more history than anything else. So those are a few things that I enjoy doing, uh, but there are others. Is that how you get your information primarily, is from reading? 
reading and interacting with uh, other people, people mm -hmm. who are uh, authorities, experts in their fields. They could mm -hmm. be people within government. At the Mackinac Center, we come into contact quite often with people who are uh, leaders in government, uh, leaders in the public policy world uh, from mm -hmm. all over the world, frankly, uh, not only in the U.S., but in many countries. Uh, I enjoy getting to know people from other countries mm -hmm. and have uh, done that so many times that when I am in Washington, D.C., for instance, in a cab, you know, the cab drivers are almost invariably from another country. Right. And I enjoy guessing what country they're from. And friends who have been with me uh, would tell you that they, uh, they marvel at how often I get it right. But uh, that's because I've interacted so often that I can tell maybe by an accent uh, or by appearance uh, roughly where a person may be from. Uh, but I enjoy that. I enjoy uh, um, a multiplicity of interactions with different cultures and people. Um. So often you hear that people are all the same and they want the same things. With all the people you know, is that true or do you think culture determines what you want? Oh, I think people as individuals are ultimately masters of their destiny and, and we are creatures of free will. So as individuals, our choices, our ideas that are very peculiar to us as individuals largely determine our course in life. And now, of course, we're buffeted by uh, political realities, by where we live, and many other constraints. But by and large, people mm -hmm. everywhere want the same basic things. And most people, they want peace, they want progress, they want prosperity, they want to know, they want to learn, they want to be educated, um, they want uh, to interact peacefully with others. There are plenty of exceptions, we know that. You look around the world, you see lots of strife. But uh, that's often driven by a relatively uh, few most people really want uh, the same things. They want strong families, they want peace, they want progress, they want uh, freedom, uh, they want to be left alone uh, to uh, go as far as their God-given talents will take them. I, I often wonder if, um, if one of the issues around that isn't, isn't how much responsibility does a person want to take. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's really where the rubber hits the road. I mean, you have I think everything I've just said is very true, but then there are people who want these things but don't also want the responsibility that is attendant to these things. That's why it's important uh, when we talk about freedom in a free society that you also talk about the flip side of that, which is responsibility. Uh, it isn't enough to simply want to be free and say, I'm free, I can do whatever I want. You have to accept the responsibility of being accountable for your actions of being responsible to those around you, fulfilling your obligations, meeting your contracts, taking care of your family. Uh, those kinds of things are, are necessary obligations and responsibilities, the flip side of, of freedom in a free society. What I noticed is in, um, in my own experience, is, uh, and perhaps I do it sometimes myself, but um, not so much really, is that often people will blame either others or conditions for their yes. disappointments or whatever they don't like that they wish were different. And myself, I, I think and try to live by the idea that it's this way, <laughs> so mm -hmm. what can I do? Yeah. What yeah. can I do to move this, however small or however big? And That's right. so I feel that by and large, I'm not so encumbered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think people encumber themselves somewhat by um, um, blaming a group or blaming others or, you know, blaming the rich yes. or blaming yeah. the this one or the, the this and the that. And I think you get lost a lot yes. in um, how to sort out where you want to be. You know, you're talking about having goals and moving towards them. Yes. If you can just drop all that and say, <laughs> okay, what do I need to do next? What are the two or three things? That's and right, just, yeah. you know. Well, I agree with you. I think uh, almost always blaming someone else is, is misplaced or overwrought uh, that a person ought to take charge of his life or her life and decide that whatever the obstacles may be, I, th there is some room for me to make judgments and determine my course in life. And that's empowering. What that says is, I'm, I'm going to be in charge of my life uh, to the extent that uh, um, all the constraints that may fa face me permit that. I'm going to use uh, my powers of, uh, uh, and my abilities, my talents, uh, to their fullest extent and shape my life. 
that is so much more empowering and inspiring and, and, and motivating to a person than the idea that, well, oh, woe was me, uh, everybody else is impinging on me, it's their fault. Now that is defeatism, it's uninspiring, you'll bring no one to your cause if, if you're always blaming someone else. So I agree, take charge of your life and make the most of it. Sometimes it's hard to change your attitude though. I mean, you seem to have either been born or accreted, <laughs> <laughs> right? A buoyancy and mm -hmm. a, um, a willingness to bounce like a ball, you know, forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's hard sometimes to get that if you don't have that. And I, I, um, I represented my college um, at the investiture of the new president of the University of Michigan. And during the ceremonial, uh, uh, well, preceding the ceremonies, the bus ride over, I happened to sit next to a, uh, another person who was representing his college, but he was at the university. And he's interested in youth and how they um, go wrong or make mm -hmm. bad decisions. And one of the things he said to me that I have thought about for quite a while, he said, because I asked him, why do you think people keep repeating mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when they know it's going to go against them? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he said, because he thought, he said to me, I mean, he said he thought it was because it was comfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. That's something we should always say to ourselves before we do things that perhaps aren't yeah, yeah. helpful to us. Am I doing it? Mm -hmm. Because I really want to do it, or is it just I'm used to doing it? Yeah. You know. Well, you know, no matter the circumstance, if you look for it, there's something good about it, or something you can learn from it, something right. about it that can make you a better person. Right. Uh, but that won't happen if you sit back and fret about it, or complain about it, or blame other people for it. Uh, you have to look at life as an ongoing series of challenges that, when we meet them, we right. are better people because of it. Right. Uh, my late, very best friend, Joe Overton, from our uh, organization. Joe. Great yeah. guy. His favorite verse from scripture was 2 Timothy 1.7, which I find uh, enormously uh, powerful. It is, uh, God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And you, know, you knew Joe, so you know right. he, he really lived that. And when you gather around you people who think in those terms of, they're self-disciplined, they're motivated, uh, they're courageous. It's inspiring. And uh, so try to do that. Try to, again, read about people who had such great attributes. One of the things I try to do, but maybe not as well as I wish I could do it, is to, to inject humor. Yes. That when something gets horrible, then of course I, like everyone else, have horrible periods. Um, um, I try. I just try, sometimes I can't, but I really try to tell myself whatever I can find in it that's funny. Yes. And somehow that um, gives a sense of, well, fun, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but also a sense of it isn't really so important. Yeah. Because, you yeah. know, we can really have to deal with this. I mean, yeah. what's done is done, and you have, like Joe, poor Joe, yes. you know. But in, in certain cases where we have choice, you know. Mm -hmm then we can move forward. Joe's was a real tragedy for all of us. Well, a sense of humor is, I think, critical to happiness in life. Uh, Joe certainly had one. Right. And uh, I, I think it's important to cultivate that. Again, that comes from a mental attitude of, I'm in charge of my life. I can uh, make things, uh, or shape my future, I should say. Uh, and I think when you have that kind of sunny optimism and feel good about life, that you're in charge of it, well, it's easier to laugh about the things around you, and it comes more easy, as opposed to the attitude of, uh, again, oh, woe was me. Um, take charge of your life, enjoy it to the fullest. That means having a good sense of humor, absolutely. It's and you teach yourself humor? Well, I, I'm not sure if you can teach it to yourself, but I certainly have been inspired by those who have had a good sense of humor, and, and maybe mine has been strengthened by observing those people. So. Uh, uh, at least you ought to teach yourself the, the idea that uh, you shouldn't take yourself seriously all the time. Right. There is such a thing as fun, right. that there is such a thing as, uh, as humor, and that uh, it's, it's a healthy attitude. And I know that there have been studies out there showing that a good laugh, and many good laughs, is actually physically healthy for you. So, if Are your parents funny? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah as I think back, my mother is still living. Uh, yeah, quite often there were many laughs. What do they uh, emphasize at home with you, attitudinally? Well, I think uh, excellence comes through, uh, especially from my father. My father um, always stressed the point that if it's worth doing at all, it's worth doing right mm -hmm. and as well as you can. That was imbued in me early on, that uh, you should do the very best that you can do in everything that you do. Uh, because in the end, uh, you want to be able to look back on the life and say, I did all that I could, and I did it as well as I could, and I'm happy with what I've accomplished. Uh, no regrets. And I think that to, to be in that position at the end of your life, I think you have to have had a lifetime of, of uh, pursuing excellence, of wanting to be mm -hmm. the best you can be in all that, uh, that you do. I mean, isn't it a wonderful feeling when you feel as though you've done your best and perhaps others have noticed and maybe been inspired by that in the mm. process. There's what did your mother emphasize? Uh, eat my vegetables. <laughs> 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 um, well, that's true. Uh, and I guess maybe I could say she certainly emphasized that uh, the, vir the, the, the uh, virtues of a, of a, of a healthy life um, uh, in terms of what you eat. Uh, I think many times when I didn't want to eat my spinach or something, she'd tell me it's good for you, eat it anyway. Uh, so that, that comes through loud and clear, I guess. And she did uh, encourage me to, uh, to read. Uh, she wasn't particularly a great reader herself, but she understood the value of reading and encouraged me to do that. Um, so at a time when uh, many of my friends were out playing uh, in the street, I was in the living room somewhere reading a book. Um, and I think that helped prepare me for what I do for a living today. Where, where did you grow up? At Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, a little town near Pittsburgh, and really, to be technical, three miles outside of Beaver Falls in a little suburb. <laughs> uh, but it was a very uh, a rural upbringing in uh, western Pennsylvania. I moved to Michigan in 1977. Do you think the rural life um, gives fortitude? I mean, so many people who come off the farms or out of the yes. rural say they gain some kind of something, either they had to get away or they learn discipline or, or something. No, I think there is something to that. Certainly in my case, I look back on it and I say, yeah, the fact that we lived out in the country um, and we had a lot of open space uh, encouraged me to, uh, uh, to, to grow things. I had an ever bigger garden every year, so I think I learned the virtue of tending to things, taking care of them, um, and uh, that has stuck with me. Uh, and I think friendships seem mm. to be deeper and stronger uh, in rural areas. I, I'm not sure why, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I sense that uh, you know, there's a certain anonymity about living in a big city. Yes. And people don't tend necessarily to be as close, closely knit as they are when they grow up in, uh, in rural areas. That's a sense anyway. I can't point to a study that would verify that, but that's a sense I have. One thing you didn't mention was television. Mm -hmm. Um, so is, does that, is that, where does that in your life? Well, I really don't watch all that much television uh, and never have. Uh, I have to say that the, I haven't seen a single situation comedy for more than one or two minutes in 30 years. Um, I miss the old, uh, you know, Jackie Gleason uh, honeymooners and right. uh, those of the 50s and 60s. I don't think we've ever replicated them since, the, the great comedians of that era. Right. And so much of television today is, seems to be so superficial, uh, with a lot of poor acting, and uh, so often they have to resort to uh, um, uh, substandard behavior and language that I don't find mm. very attractive. So I actually don't watch all that much television. You're not even C-SPAN? Uh, no, I stopped watching C-SPAN, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, no, C-SPAN I do catch every now and then. I was thinking CNN. I, I was going to say I stopped watching CNN when the Fox Network began. I watch a little bit more of that. Uh, but uh, C-SPAN, every now and then I'll catch uh, uh, something like book notes or an yeah. interview with somebody that I find attractive. But unfortunately, I'm on the road so much or, uh, or tending to writing and reading that uh, my TV time tends to be fairly limited. I, I have a great understanding of that because I too am a reader hmm. and I find that's how I enter other people's worlds but also bring it into mm -hmm. to mine and um, 
That's interesting. I just wondered how, I learned to read very early in my yes. life. Mm -hmm. I always thought that that took me to magic places mm -hmm. that I, I just couldn't go, you know. Yes. And I'd sit on the floor of the library and go from book to book or section to section. Yes. And um, I don't think that's, you know, people do that right now. They, they go on the internet and yeah. they, you know, they find out whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it is a, um, it is, it leaves you with a sense that you can go deeply into yes. something. And mm -hmm. the internet, which I really also like, means you can go quickly yes. and ultimately, possibly deeply. Yes. So it's a just, just a maybe less haphazard way than when I was, you know, crawling around the library floor sure. looking at books on the lower levels. Anyway, we want to thank Larry for being with us today. We learned a great, great deal from Larry. Um, some of the things are that um, the attitude is very important. His optimism or his enthusiasm, he calls it optimism, has carried him a very long way in life because it enables him to continue action towards the goals that are very important to him. Early on in life, he got very interested in freedom. And what was the other one? <laughs> uh, sound policy, uh, limited government. L uh, <laughs> you get the gist. <laughs> <laughs> the ideas of our founders. <laughs> right. And, and really has dedicated his life to towards moving in that direction for himself, but also for other people. He has also found that his optimism uh, helps him motivate other people, but also motivates himself whereby should he encounter a closed door or difficult uh, situation, he can quickly evaluate, can this be changed or do I have to find another way of doing it or even take a different, slightly different direction, if I may put words in your mouth somewhat. He also um, is very interested in learning and taking strength from the lives of other people, largely through the written um, biographies about them, the great leaders of their times. And furthermore, that, that the sense of humor or fun is very important to have in your life, particularly your work. Uh, going to work for him is a very, um, very satisfying, but also very fun, because one, it has variety, and two, he's advancing towards what he feels are major goals in his life, which include character building for eternity. Um, he also learned from his father to do the very best he can, so that when you look back on your life, you can say, I really tried, you know, I really did it. And the corollary to that, perhaps again putting in words in, in, in his mouth or his dad's mouth, is may not always get there, but at least you did make the effort to, uh, that was consistent with your own values. Um, Larry doesn't watch really uh, television, so to speak, in, in, in any real means and dedicates his time to interaction with people, with books, with his work and his friends, uh, which a very close friend was lost. It was very hard for him and for all of us um, anyway this past summer. But the, the need to live a full life, to live a balanced life and to live a productive life, I would say it's really um, a major source yes. of uh, value and effort on your part. Um, when you see Larry around town, please thank him for sharing. And remember, kindness counts. Kindness is so important. Please do something wonderful for someone you know today and for someone you don't know. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. So long. Thank you. you might be to share your comments and suggestions, contact Junior. The email address is juniordoan at aol.com or write to Post Office Box 169, Midland, Michigan, 48640.